Hey, good evening. I'm just going to give people an opportunity to log on, see how things are going. <clears throat> and uh, this evening, the, the topic for this evening is prayer. And if you, there should be a link to the notes just below this on Facebook on the website as well and uh, yeah as always this will eventually make its way across to YouTube in the fullness of time okay. give it another second or two My watch says it's about seven o'clock, so I'll get started. And this evening, I wanted to talk a little bit about prayer. And uh, for me, part of this is about, I've often done, you know, the kids thing where you give guide to kids for prayer, like um, the old teaspoon prayer. And when you abbreviate teaspoon, it's thank you, it's TSP in a cookbook and thank you sorry please um, and acts adoration confession thanksgiving and supplication those sorts of things but you know it's like it's like a great ocean and those those things are good for children they're a good entry point into the idea of prayer. And we'll tell kids that, you know, prayer is talking to God. And then we'll tell kids that prayer is like a conversation with God. So just like a good conversation with a friend, it involves talking and it involves listening. And that's all true. But prayer is a much broader topic than that. So for this evening, what I've done is I've gathered together some, some ideas, some introductory points, some concepts to share with you. <clears throat> and this is by no means exhaustive. <laughs> Not even close. Not even close. But I hope it's interesting. And I hope that what it does is it gives you some ideas to hang concepts on as you explore your own prayer life so that you can take your own prayer beyond those useful but perhaps still childish tools for uh, for prayer. <clears throat> So I wanted to start with this beautiful quote I found uh, by uh, Rabbi Bradley Artson. And the rabbi says, prayer is nearly ubiquitous, almost a synonym for being human. Isn't that an interesting concept? That prayer is integral to, human to humanity, wherever people are found. And perhaps you could say whenever, there you will find someone reaching out to the oneness, the cosmos, the divine, the mystery. So, so right there, there's something of the notion of prayer is about trying to reach across, perhaps bridge a gap <coughs> through words. Meditation, movement, offerings, renunciations, charity, good deeds, protest, dance, incense, and a host of other ways human beings from remote antiquity have stretched to create connections between themselves to something larger, something more fundamental. Now, there's some really big concepts in there that I think are worth unpacking before we move further. So the first is the list there. You know, um, 
most people, when they think of prayer, they probably think of words. Uh, and, and, you know, that makes sense. It's the metaphor of talking to God, of having a conversation with God. We use that language that it's around word so often. And some of us perhaps might think of things like meditations and uh, you know, meditating on the Word of God or, or, or something like that. Perhaps prayerful movement if you've ever done a labyrinth or something like that. But the rabbi includes uh, other things like uh, renunciations. So the, the, sort of the traditional Lenten idea of giving things up for Lent becomes an act of prayer in and of itself. So not just that it feeds our prayer life, but it is in itself an act of prayer. Uh, but then, uh, you know, protest. When, when, when Christians gather together to protest something, that that too is prayer. It's an act of prayer. It's an act to together try to express and reach across and bridge the gap, if you will, between the human experience and the fundamental divine experience. And when we start to think like that, it puts some of these activities into a very different frame. And I like the fact that the dance is included. Not that I'm much of a dancer myself. Having born, being born with the amazing condition of two left feet and no coordination. But that movement and, and expression through movement, I think, is fabulous. And then he talks about creating the connection between ourselves or themselves and something larger, something more fundamental. And so included in this is the picture that rather than just being larger, uh, and, and I suppose, once again, going back to the kind of the childish image, the childish image of God is usually a parent, mum or dad, but perhaps even better. So as big as the gap is between the child and the parent, the same gap exists between the parent and God. And so essentially God is just the magnified, enhanced version of the parent. But as time progresses and as you explore that prayerfully, you start to see that it is in fact uh, deeper. And in, and in fact, when we pray, we're not trying to bridge the gap between us and Superman, but rather to, and I'm going to use the term bridge the gap between us and the very cons fun, the glue of the universe. And when we put it in that context, prayer is always a mystical experience. And sometimes we write it off as a shopping list. So I wanted to give you a couple of things. One of the things we often have in Anglican Church, uh, yeah, is, is the collects. You know, the, the prayers that we have? And they often, to modern ears, sound a little stilted, if you will. They sound... A little odd, but they actually have a very consistent pattern, and it's a pattern that the prayers have had for a long time. And although I often tell people that the collect is there to collect our thoughts, it's not. It's it's the prayer, and it comes from Latin, that we say collected together. It's a liturgical prayer, liturgy being the work of the people, and this is the people come together. And it starts with an invocation, you know, almost like a letter, if you will. Most letters start with Dear Mum or Dear Dad or Dear Aunt Rose. And this starts with an invocation, an address, but also uh, a calling to mind. 
and it's usually uh, one of the pe pe persons of the ho of the Trinity. Well, it's, so Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Most frequently, God the Father, in some title. So uh, the one for tomorrow, in fact, starts with Heavenly Father. And then there's an acknowledgement of what it is about, in this case, the Heavenly Father that we are invoking. What are we calling down into this moment? And for tomorrow, it's loving shepherd of your people. So the image of God the Father as a loving shepherd. The petition, the, the, the prayerfulness. And tomorrow we remember uh, James... Uh, I think it's James Holland, uh, who was an Aboriginal minister. We thank you for your servant James, who was faithful in the care and nurture of your flock. And this is, the, this is in a sense, the action part of the prayer, the aspiration. What do we want? And we pray that we may follow the good of his example and grow into the fullness of the stature. So, so we, we, we're essentially praying collectively that we might be like James, which I think is a wonderful prayer to make. And our conclusion. And in our conclusion, we indicate the, that we do this prayer through the uh, saving power of, God, of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And we respond collectively of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So, the, our collects have a structure to them. And sometimes that doesn't feel like a normal conversation. But like a, like a, a letter, if you will, you know, uh, and a formal letter as opposed to, say, a text message or, or something like that. It is a... It, it's a formal letter to God. And so it follows a formal and traditional structure. I think that's useful for us to think about. I want to introduce you to another one. Another prayer. Uh, and it's called Lectio Divina. And it is a contemplative way of reading the Bible. So rather than being uh, an intercessory where we're praying for, for the world and for others, not that there's a problem with that at all, uh, it's, it's a way of prayerfully engaging with Scripture. So it's, it's quite old. It, it dates back to the early centuries of the Christian church. Um, and it was became the established way of prayer in uh, many of the Benedictine monasteries in the 6th century. So Lectio Divina has been around for a long time. And it's a way of praying the scriptures that leads us deep into God's word. And we slow down. Quite often we, we focus on our breath. Perhaps we relax our muscles. And we read a short passage of scripture, and we'll read it more than once. And we, we chew on it, slowly, carefully. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an almost a tactile experience of the Word of God. And in this way, Scripture speaks to us in a different way. It speaks to us personally. And in doing that, it aids the union we have with God. Through Jesus Christ. This is very similar to... Uh, <clears throat> I uh, was taken through something like this a number of years ago. And it was very impacting. And the piece of scripture was the baptism of Jesus. And I've used it subsequently with people as a meditation, 
of just sitting there, reading the scriptures a few times over, letting them speak, asking myself the question, where in this story am I? Where do I see myself? Am I an observer from on high? Am I one of the characters integral to the story? Am I an onlooker? What does that part of the story feel like? What would it have smelt like, even? Lectio Divina can be a very powerful tool for growing in our understanding of Scripture, particularly, uh, I, I find, in the way Scripture might speak to the modern context. Because it's all about the human connection with the, you know, with, with the sacred text. Very powerful tool. The next one I wanted to speak to you about uh, is, is called Centering Prayer. And it's something that uh, Richard Rohr, who's a great spiritual writer, uh, uses, teaches. And it's again... It's a form of contemplative prayer. Um, and like all contemplative prayer, it's, it's, it's a relationship with God and it's a discipline to build and foster that relationship. It's, you know, the thing is, uh, with friendships, with all relationships, if you don't spend some time investing in them they just become memories and all you have is is stories from back when back when we were at school back when back when but if we continue to invest in them we continue to uh um just you know engage and, and grow with them so Richard Ross says, Centering Prayer is based on the wisdom saying of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to pray, enter your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And he says, you know, the Father refers to a personal relationship. And if that doesn't work for you, if, if, if that doesn't, you know, if, if, if the term Father doesn't work, What's another personal relationship that will, that, that will help you uh, symbolically, you know, in, enter deeply and symbolically into this? You know, maybe mother, brother, soul friend, uh, spouse, whatever. Whatever language helps you understand that it's primarily about relationship. The first step in, in centering prayer is to enter your inner room. And, and quite often we talk about the heart in um, many of the religious traditions. Uh, and it's, to, it's your inner self. It's your, in a sense, your, the truest self you can access um, uh, that goes beyond senses and thinking. And to then close the door it's your closing the door becomes a symbolic language for for closing out the distractions the the thoughts the preoccupations the memories the plans just putting all those things aside just being present with god is 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 the goal is the end point if you will of of uh centering prayer and i suppose like, try this mental picture on for size it may work for you it may not but in the movies when you see a couple in love and there's that moment where they are sitting at a table and they're sharing a milkshake 
And the whole world is gone except for those two people. They are each other's center. And centering prayer is about entering into the center of God and letting God enter into our own center. Now, Richard Ross says those steps are guidelines. Uh, other pe people use all sorts of things, you know. Um, some people use a word. Uh, some people uh, concentrate on breathing. Some people have a, a, a sacred image that they ref reflect on to help bring them back to that center. So as you breathe in and as your awareness starts to get distracted, just let your breath, as you breathe out, let yourself return to that centered space with God. Perhaps an image. Uh, there might be uh, an image that is significant to you, that is sacred. And as your mind wanders, as you start to feel anxious and concerned for the day and all, all those things, You let that image guide you back to the center. There are signs of our intention to be in God's presence and to be open to the divine action. This prayer is not designed to produce anything. It's not, it's not about change in the world or anything like that. But rather, it's, if anything, it's about to change in yourself, that you might proceed more fully centered on God, with fewer self-imposed obstacles between yourself and, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I know the work of Richard Raw, and I'm sure he wouldn't be upset if centering prayer led to godly action in the world. Um, action is a very important part of the contemplative model for, for Richard Raw. When I say no, I, I know of. I have never had the privilege of meeting him. I wanted to share one more. And this comes from some practitioners of process theology. So process theology is... Theology that, amongst other things, affirms the dynamic, relational nature of God and that all things are, in various levels, in connection with, with each other and with God. So, so the human connection with God is both unique, it's... it's this is something that only we have, and also common in that all of creation has a connection with God. And that as we experience things, as we change, by extension there is a change within God. Not, not necessarily in the very nature of God, but um, in the way God interacts and in the way God expresses God's love. And in that context, they, they, they speak about a me to you prayer. And I think those are very carefully chosen words. Because it starts with, with me. Now, often prayer starts with trying to remove me. Uh, you know, um, if you think about the centering prayer of Richard Raw, it's about removing some of the mind, the chatter of the mind, and those sorts of things. Uh, the collects that I mentioned briefly uh, are, are kind of uh, not a me, but a we. They're the very carefully constructed formal words of the group. Uh, even the Lectio Divino is about putting ourselves into the scriptures. The me to you is just that. But it's far deeper than that. And in, in a sense, it is still their relational language. Reaching out, prayer, is an act of giving ourselves to the receptive side of God. 
to to leaning into the the faith we have that there is in the very nature of God a listening loving ear and 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 it's both of those things together and so the me is all of me it's the me that i uh i'm happy for you to know it's the me that i i'm not happy for you to know it's the me that even i don't know you know that's the me that's the unknown within me and in prayer all of that comes and it reaches out to the you, the to God. That is the the fundamental uh, divine act of the world. It's not a denial of individuality. It's a it's here I am. Um, and they would see this as kind of coming back um, to the words of Rabbi Bradley Artson. They, they would see this as being a part of prayer that is broader than certainly just the Christian tradition. They would suggest that um, a, a, a Buddhist lighting incense and placing it in front of a statue of uh, Kuan Yin, um, uh, uh, the Buddha of Grace, the Graceful Mother, um, and then bowing, has the same me to you nature to it. We might we might disagree about the theology behind it, but the intent of the all of me to the all of you that is the divine fundamental of the universe. Or a Christian doing the same before an icon of Mary, again the Divine Mother. In the folding of the hands, in the kneeling, both are placing themselves in the presence of the listening, uh, and it's it's that active listening, and that is a great work. So that's what I had for you this evening. Oh, um, very quickly. Uh, I just chose those images if you do have the notes because for me they spoke very much of a prayerfulness and the dark background eh, prayer is always um, in a sense of reaching into the dark uh, there's that phrase in order to pray you have to be a little bit atheist um, in that you have to have somewhere inside you uh, the belief that there needs to be a connection. Um, and so for me, prayer is always, in a sense, a reaching into the unknown, which in image is usually depicted by uh, the dark. So I've got one or two questions. If anything else has triggered, throw them up. Um, Simon says hi, and uh, and just uh, loving the dancing. Um, yeah, uh, dancing through life, dancing in prayer, uh, and and dancing prayerfully. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for that as a as an image. David asked uh, Lectio Divino, personal or group or both. Uh, Obviously, the first time I was in any way, shape, or form involved with it, it was as a group exercise uh, led by someone, and I've led it that way. I've also practiced it myself at times. I find that in terms of personal prayer, I there are a number of disciplines that I cycle through uh, at various different times, um, and it's, uh, you know, sometimes they... For me, when I feel that a thing becomes uh, rote, it's no longer helpful, and so I will try something else. Um, yeah. <laughs> and a comment uh, from, from Paul or Alex. And prayer has been demonstrated to improve physical health by actual scientists. It certainly has. 
mental, physical health. Um, just that, uh, yeah, it's just that spending time and, and the, help manage it, you know, yeah, it's just, it does, it's, it is very powerfully helpful, uh, particularly when it inspires transformation. And Greg just said thank you for a good study, and so uh, thank you. I, I think that's it for this evening. I hope that was interesting or helpful, and I'll say good night. Remember, it will end up on YouTube later on. Bye.